My name is James, and this talk is going to be about fun. Fun games, making fun games, and having fun making fun games. And since everyone's definition of fun is a little different, this talk will be pretty subjective and autobiographical. But hopefully, by the end of it, you'll be feeling inspired and able to, to put a little more fun in your next project. So a little about me. Um, I've worked at companies like SendGrid and Orink, uh, primarily as a web developer. But I've always had a fascination with game development. Some of my earliest memories are of uh, making games with my dad on our black and white Apple Macintosh. And the program we used was HyperCard. Anybody use HyperCard before? A few, wow, actually quite a few. Awesome. Uh, so HyperCard was this uh, general purpose software uh, that could make almost anything from like business software like uh, invoicing or uh, catalogs and wikis. But I know it primarily as a platform for game development, mostly like weird uh, point and click adventure games. Um, and the way I understood it was like it was like a series of cards, and you draw pictures on these cards and uh, click buttons to go to different cards. So, for example, if I wanted to make a game, I can go to my tools and just uh, tear off my tools and put them right there. And I want to draw a door. So, to make a door, I click on my rectangle tool, draw a rectangle like that, so I have the door frame, and I want to make a doorknob. So, I go to my oval tool and I draw my doorknob. And I want it to, when a user uh, clicks on this door, they go to a different card with a different picture on it. So I'll make a button. So I go to objects, and I go to new button. There it is, and I can just drag this button up here, and then drag the corner down so it fills out uh, the door. Now I want to make this button invisible, so I double click on the button, and I get this big modal, and all I know is that to make it invisible, I have to uncheck show name and change the style to transparent. And now it's invisible. And now I uh, want it to link to a different card. So I click link to, and it asks me, all right, which card do you want to link it to? And uh, I haven't made this card yet, so I go to new card. And I say, yes, this card, the card that I'm on, link here. And so now when I click on this button, I go to this new card. So what's behind the door? Uh, how about a cat? Or maybe a lion? Maybe an angry lion? Maybe an angry, hungry lion? Ah, game over. And if you repeat this process enough times, you eventually get a game. And this was so much fun for me as a kid. I probably had more fun making games than my friends did playing them. And yeah, HyperCard was like a toy to me. It was so tactile. I could uh, drag and manipulate anything. I mean, look at these. Like, I know it's objective, but to me as a kid who was new to computing in general, this felt intuitive. It was all one cohesive environment. It felt like a sandbox. Um, yeah, like everything was uh, tactile. Uh, there was no like coding step or anything. Uh, what you see is what you got. And all this like instant feedback made it just feel really fun. And so fast forward a couple of decades. Uh, after HyperCard, I tinkered around a bit with Adobe Flash, making weird animated music videos, uh, simple arcade games, and then finally settled on good old HTML5, uh, CSS, and JavaScript. And I did a few game jams with JavaScript, but I never really finished anything, at least nothing, anything that good. Um, I always got like, just bogged down by the code. And I found that I was like, getting just really uh, burnt out making JavaScript games. <laughs> because making uh, JavaScript games with no framework was really challenging for me. I had to keep so much logic in my head. Uh, it was really hard to hunt down bugs. And the code just felt brittle. And I just didn't want to ever like, work on my games. Like, the more I worked on a game, the less I wanted to work on it, because I was just fearful of the code. And so then when I heard uh, about Elm and the murmurings that Elm is, might be good for game development, I was intrigued. And so I thought, all right, uh, to learn Elm, I'm going to uh, clone one of my old JavaScript games that I had abandoned and turn it into an Elm app. And it felt awesome. I could fearlessly code. I didn't have to worry about uh, missing cases or runtime exceptions. Um, everything just kind of clicked together. And so um, I really like, fell in love with Elm. Uh, I learned how to lean on the compiler, uh, the compiler's fast feedback. And with that fast feedback, I found I could make meaningful progress and not you know, lose track of, uh, of my progress. And so I eventually used uh, Elm for websites, for work, for games. And I noticed something. Developing with a spec feels very different than developing without a spec. 
Uh, so for example, a spec would be like any kind of written specifications like a user story often paired with a pixel perfect mockup. Um, and this is great like as a develop developer because a lot of work is done for you. All you have to do is just uh, implement the behavior with the code and make the visuals match the mockup. And yeah, sometimes it can be a little tedious, like if you have to move a button two pixels to the left, but at least it's verifiable. You know, you have a mockup, you have very uh, discrete QA steps, and you eventually finish one way or another, which is more than can be said about hobby projects where you're developing without a spec. Uh, so maybe you're working on something more creative, like a game, uh, or maybe you're working with a, a small team where you're wearing multiple hats, and maybe you're both the developer and the designer, what then? Turns out you have to make a lot of decisions, like a lot of decisions, way more than you might think. Uh, because you're not just concerned about the implementation details, you have to worry about all the visual details too. So imagine you're making a uh, modal. Like the behavior might be easy enough as a programmer, but now you have to think about, okay, how do I style this modal? What does the background look like? Is there a border, maybe a drop shadow? How strong is the drop shadow? What about the padding in the margin? How do I, how do I center this thing if the user uh, makes their window kind of small? Do I shrink the font? Do I add a scroll wheel? Do I clip the content? Like, it can be really overwhelming. There's all these little micro decisions that you have to face like at nearly every step. Um, and I found like I really need a good working environment to avoid all this like mental fatigue because when you're working on a hobby project, your time and willpower is a very precious resource. And so I need a working environment where I can make decisions easily and test decisions easily. Uh, I need a, an environment where I can tinker and test and try out new things. Uh, what I need is instant feedback. Uh, because of uh, slow feedback, every one of those decisions feels just really slow and painful. But when you have fast feedback, you make progress faster, you feel motivated, and it feels more joyful. Uh, so here's a real example. Um, of a time where I had an idea of something I wanted to build, but the details were blurry. I didn't really have a you know, crystal clear image of what I uh, wanted to eventually end up with, but I just had a, a gut feeling of what I wanted to make. Uh, so it all started when I saw this uh, YouTube video randomly on Boyd's, and Boyd's is a kind of uh, artificial intelligence simulation uh, that kind of looks like birds flocking, or maybe a, like a school of fish. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. I want to make that in Elm. And at this point, I had very little experience in Elm, and I thought, well, this would be a, a good learning experience to um, uh, better understand it. And so uh, it took me a long time to really uh, figure out how to do this in a functional language, like functional language was a brand new thing to me. Uh, but I eventually got it, and I felt really happy when it finally compiled, and when I ran it, it looked like this. Ah, they're flocking. Oh, but they're, they're flocking too hard, like they're... <laughs> They're like just clumping together now. So I thought, well, all right, I can, I, can, I can fix this. I don't have to panic. Um, I just have to you know, tweak a few numbers here and there. Uh, so what did my feedback loop look like? Well, I have observed that you know, the boids are, you know, they're boiding too hard. So let's um, change the code so that when I observe again, they can flock a little nicely. Um, but before I can make a change in my code, I have to ask myself, all right, which value needs to change and by how much? Because I have all these magic numbers sprinkled throughout my app. Um, they all like determine how my boy is going to move. Um, so for example, I have a cohesion factor, uh, which, de which determines uh, how closely, or um, like how much a boy wants to group together with other boys. Uh, but then I also have like a separation factor, which determines how much a boy wants to repel against boys who are uh, too close together, if they're crowded. So I thought, OK, if they're clumping, should I increase the separation factor? or do I decrease the cohesion factor, and by how much? I have no idea. So I just have to make a you know, random guess, and I guess I'm all right with that, like a little bit of guesswork is okay. Uh, but then after I make that uh, change, I then have to save, compile, switch back to my browser for my editor, and refresh the page, and when I do that, I see something like this. Uh, did I improve it? Did I make it worse? They're going up, what does that mean? Uh, so I really have like, no idea like, if I you know, did the right thing. And so there is uh, guesswork in the observe step also. And that's just a lot of guesswork. And the feedback loop is really slow because I'm context switching between my browser and my editor. And like, I just get this like, anxiety and this fatigue of like, yeah, I'm not really sure what I should do. Do I change anything at all? 
And it's kind of made me, uh, it made me, um, like it feels a lot like the JavaScript feedback loop that I used to experience, where when I was uh, working on JavaScript, I would just take an educated guess as to what to change my JavaScript, and then save, compile, switch back to my browser, refresh, and then observe and maybe poke around and try to trigger that runtime exception again. Maybe I fixed it, maybe I didn't, and it just felt bad. Um, and like what I love about Elm is that Elm traditionally has a really tight feedback loop where I'm always at the keyboard, and if I observe that my compiler has uh, you know, an error somewhere, I try to fix the error, I save, and I just glance to my right, because I usually have my editor and my compiler on the same screen, so I'm just glancing back and forth, hands always on the keyboard, and it feels really nice. I have a really uh, tight feedback loop. All right, so what is my goal here? My goal is I want that same kind of instant feedback for tweaking these values. Uh, so where to begin here? Uh, well, let's try to shrink some of these error, uh, arrows down. So let's start at the bottom here. Uh, you know, why are we even like switching context back and forth between an editor and a browser? Uh, why don't we use forms? And forms are awesome. Um, and like Elm is actually really great at forms. So let's see what that would look like. So here are uh, um, my body example now with a form here. And now all of my configuration values um, can be changed. I can increase the cohesion weight like that from 20 to 200. I can increase my separation factor uh, weight up a little bit more. And uh, this also gets uh, saved, so if I refresh the page, uh, it saves my settings. So I can like iteratively uh, tweak these values. Uh, but there's something that didn't really you know, feel right to me. So for example, if I wanted to change my uh, void size from 30 to 35, that happens. Where I, when I delete the last number and add a uh, zero or five, I get this in-between state where they are exactly three pixels. So that doesn't really feel great. I can't really say what's better, 30 or 35. I have to like really click fast and it just doesn't feel right. So I did the bare minimum here as a form, but we can do a lot better. So I try to look around for inspiration. Um, so as a web developer, I often do this, where I would, like let's say I want to um, increase this paragraph font size. I would right click, inspect that element, and then I can just uh, manually code and what this font size to be, uh, maybe 15 pixels, and then I can use my arrow keys to click up, 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 or down, 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 and get this nice smooth, um, you know, gradual transition between one value to the next. And this works pretty well for web development because you're dealing with pixels, and it's for things like font size or paddings, margins, um, and these things generally don't go beyond like 50 pixels. It's right around zero to 50, so I can just hold down and back up, and you're dealing with uh, integer pixels, so this sort of does everything you need for web development, but if I wanna get into game development and simulations, I really need something more granular. Uh, so let's look at that GUI, and you may have seen this uh, kind of interface before. Um, they really embrace uh, sliders here, so I can slide this value back and forth, and that changes the effect on the left. Uh, so this is cool, it's uh, pretty granular, it's very smooth, uh, but my issue with it is it has a maximum and a minimum. I can't go beyond uh, five or negative five, and when you're doing a, something like a simulation, you really have no idea what your min and max are gonna be. And so like to use this, you have to actually uh, put your minimum and, ma and maximum values in the code, and ideally, I wanna keep my magic numbers far away from my Elm code. Elm code is for business logic. My magic numbers should live like in uh, JSON data. Um, so if we're really aspiring to be like game developers, uh, what does a game engine do? Uh, so we have uh, Unity here, and Unity is like a really uh, popular game engine. And what I like about them is that in their inspector, you can uh, click on most of these labels here, like font size, and drag your mouse left and right to increase that value. And so what if you have um, something with no minimum or maximum, like a position? You can move your mouse left and right, and you can actually just keep moving left and left and left, and it keeps going, even though my, my mouse is like butting up against the uh, left side of the screen. And you can go to the right again. And this feels like really liberating. Like I'm on a trackpad right now, but with a mouse you can go really far to the left, really far to the right, and then just wiggle it when you want that kind of specific uh, granular control. So all right, this is cool. I'm feeling really inspired. I want to you know, start um, refactoring and improving my fields. But before we do that, 
uh, how difficult is it to add a field? So in the browser, we care about the fast feedback for the designer changing fields, but for a developer who's actually coding this, I want it to be really easy for me to add new fields. Um, so I have my uh, config record, and it's, uh, it has things like my weights for my rules, um, other uh, configuration values like number of voids. Um, so I should probably you know, start there, add a new field there. Um, so I start with my model, and then I have to update my decoders and encoders because I'm always um, uh, encoding them for JavaScript or for uh, local storage. So it goes to JSON to local storage. So okay, I have to change those two places too. And then I have to add it uh, as a field in my view for, uh, in the form, uh, which means I have to add a message for my on, uh, on input handler, which means I have to uh, handle that in my update. And my update will have to parse that string from the input field, uh, update the model, and then uh, issue out a command to persist that in local storage. And like, I appreciate all the safety that this gives me, but when I'm like doing rapid prototyping, I can be a little impatient. And so I would love it if there was some way to make this a little more uh, generalizable. So I thought, all right, my config record is mostly just floats. So what if I were to make a uh, dictionary of floats? And so I could call uh, dict.get cohesion weight or any one of these kinds of labels uh, to my config. Well, there's two problems with that. Uh, first one is, there's nothing stopping me from having a typo in cohesion weights, and so I might get back a nothing value, but really, I'm always getting back some maybe floats, and I don't wanna have to deal with maybes all throughout my code. I'd have to have like a maybe dot with default, provide a default value, some sort of fallback, and that just seems kind of messy. Um, so how do I get something like nice and generic, but still keep all the type safety of a record? Um, so yeah, here are my three goals I want instant feedback for the designer with a, a browser with a nice form. I want it to be easy to add fields as a developer, and I still want all the um, type safety from Elm's compiler to get that nice, fast feedback. Uh, so I'm making a tool called Elm Config UI that hopefully does all of those. So here is what it looks like. And um, so I can change my, uh, some values here. I can shrink that down. Uh, make that bigger, and then I can also um, use arrow keys, just like in uh, browsers, to increase this. But uh, you can also click on a label and drag your mouse left and right like that. And we, when you let go, the cursor stays where it is. And this is using ports to use um, an H HTML5 API called pointer lock. And pointer locks usually used for things like first-person games, uh, but in this case, I'm just using it for a nice form control. So I can move that back and forth. Um, I can change my like void radius. And oh, this control seems like a little bit too sensitive. So I can actually decrease how much my um, drag affects this, this value. And now when I move my um, mouse, it changes, but it's a little more gentle. And that's really useful for things like um, uh, this personal space value, which if I just change it a little bit, you can really see the effects. And like, I really like the sweet spot between like 1.2 and 1.4. Um, and so cool, like it gives me uh, all this granularity. Uh, it can do things like uh, ints and floats and um, pools, and it can even do things like colors. So if I wanna see voids at night, I can do that like that. Um, all right, cool, so the form feel is pretty good. Um, how is it on the uh, development side? Um, so, like, how, is it, how, how easy is it to um, add a new field? So let's say I want to have like a fast motion, slow motion control. I want like a time scale um, variable where I can like control how fast it goes. Uh, well, in my tick function, uh, this tick message happens um, 60 times a second, it uses a request animation frame, and it has this delta in milliseconds, which is how long it's been since the last frame. And so I want to scale that somehow. So let me just start typing. So I'll say, uh, I want a scale time, where it'll be the delta in milliseconds, but I'll multiply that by uh, my model.config, and I'll just make up a value, maybe have a time scale. Um, and then I'll use that value instead of delta in milliseconds that I passed to my big move voids function. And when I save that, my compiler says, hey, this worker doesn't have a time scale. Uh, you know, config usually has void rad, max speed, all that, so that's expected. Now, how do I get all this functionality in one line? 
well, I have this uh, config schema file that actually isn't getting imported anywhere in my code, but I have a script that watches changes to this file and generates a lot of code for me. Uh, so uh, this thing is a list of tuples where the first item is my form label, and I'll call it timescale, and then a kind. So like I said, you can have like floats or ints or colors. Uh, this will be a float kind. And the string here will be uh, both the variable name uh, that we can use in our Elm code, and also it's how it uh, encodes to JSON. Uh, so I'll say that is timescale. And now when I save that, it checks, and cool, it's compiled. And now when we go back to here, we see, oh cool, it's added timescale. And now I can make it go fast forward. Oh, it's too fast, let me decrease how much it'll um, change by. And now I can get slow motion, fast motion, and all that in just one line. And if I refresh the page, it's all persisted in um, uh, local storage. And then at the very bottom, I have um, all my JSON that I can then uh, copy and save into a JSON file. That way, if um, a new user loads this up, they can see all the changes I've made. Um, so cool, I think we hit all three of our goals. We have instant feedback for the developer, or for the designer in the browser. Uh, it's really easy to add fields, so a developer feels empowered to make changes, and we get all of Elm's type safety. Uh, so now our feedback loop looks like this. We choose a value, and we just click and wiggle our hand, and we glance to the left, and we see changes. Uh, so cool, we have this uh, delightful environment where we get instant changes. Uh, it's really fun to play with. And we feel, uh, we get like a deeper understanding of how the application works by just fiddling with these values. Uh, similarly, Elm is a delightful environment for implementing um, business logic. And we get fast feedback from the compiler. We're at the keyboard and we just glance between our code and our compiler and it feels really nice. Uh, just like HyperCard, HyperCard felt really fun to me because it had just the right tooling where it was powerful enough for me to make simple games, but it wasn't so complex that it just overwhelmed me. Uh, I could relax, just stay in the flow of things. So in conclusion, fun is important. It empowers us, inspires us, and motivates us. It reduces stress. And I think a key ingredient in fun is fast feedback. Without fast feedback, you're just stumbling around in the dark and things can feel really frustrating. And fortunately, Elm gives us great feedback through the compiler. Um, and when it comes to things like tweaking game feel, forums can really enable fast feedback. And what's great is Elm is great at building thing, uh, tooling, uh, such as forums. And if you find that boilerplate's kind of slowing you down, consider code generation or try out Elm Config UI. Thanks. <laughs>